like a 1980s version of the future. Um, so thanks everyone for uh, um, having me here today. It's a pleasure to uh, speak with you guys. Um, I brought a little mini solar panel sample, and I'll, I'll pull it out, I guess, later in the talk. Um, uh, it's, this is what Morgan Solar makes, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the company, how we've come to where we are now, and what we're going to do next. Um, so I'll go through uh, the uh, history of the development of this product, um, what the you know what uh, underpins it. Um, speak a little bit to the design, how it's built, um, and then I'll go through what. Sorry, it's not on. Checking the pocket. And that's one there. All right. Uh, oh, I think I was turning it off and I put it in my pocket again. No. All right, I'm going to try again. So, I'll go through the history of the product, talk about the design, uh, go over some uh, performance, explain to you guys how we dissipate heat, um, talk about what we've done in terms of reliability testing, uh, and then just go on to uh, what's next. So, basically, uh, what Morgan Solar builds, what we do, uh, is we make a, a solar panel that takes the light that strikes the solar panel and concentrates it uh, to, to a tremendous degree, and we built panels where we concentrate it 2,000 times, 1,000 times, onto a very small, uh, very high efficiency solar cell at the heart of each of the optics. And we build this out into a module like this one, um, only larger and less portable. This is a concept that uh, has been in existence for a long time. Um, on the left there is a, uh, a very simple rendering from a company, um, Soytech, uh, previously Concentrix, and they basically were, a, they, uh, were an early pioneer in concentrated photovoltaics. Um, and they had this very simple concept of using a lens to focus light onto a small cell. Um, and that, that uh, was done to a, you know, to a certain degree. I guess hundreds of megawatts were built using this kind of lens into a cell concept. But the majority of the companies that were pursuing this kind of approach uh, had difficulty competing with the um, silicon PV panels, which as you heard in the last talk, have really been coming down dramatically in cost. And so the kind of bulky, costly execution of CPV, of concentrated photovoltaics, that had been pursued by these companies historically, has not been competitive with uh, silicon PV. And so back when I started Morgan Solar, I thought to myself, well, maybe there's a way that we can kind of merge the simplicity of a conventional solar panel and all of the advantages that come from having a panel which is literally a black plate um, with the high efficiency of, of uh, concentration, but without relying on kind of conventional optics um, like uh, Fresnel lenses or, uh, or various mirror configurations to do the concentration. And so back in 2010, we, uh, well, before then, we set about trying to develop a product along these lines. And what I'm showing here is uh, something that we installed at the University of Ottawa uh, back in 2010. This was a early rendition of the technology we build now. And um, then later in 2011, we sort of upgraded it, improved it, and installed it a second time. Um, and we were actually getting ready to go to market with this 2011 version of the product. That we built a large factory in San Diego. We received you know, stimulus funding from the U.S. as part of the big push for solar, and we were expanding what we were doing down there. Um, but then, come 2012, we started looking at the market, and we realized, you know, these concepts that come that were really put pen to paper in 2009 for Morgan Solar are not going to compete against silicon solar panels. Uh, in the future, because we could see that the costs were coming down really dramatically, and we realized that the technology that we developed to date um, was not was, was fundamentally going to be uncompetitive. And uh, the reason is, I mean, the reasons are manifold, but you'll notice on these panels that I'm showing you up here that while they are achieving a sort of flat form factor and a low material consumption, there's still actually quite a lot of metal, and you can see it better on the one on the, on the right there, there's still quite a lot of metal behind the uh, modules. And that's because we were using fairly large optics and we had to uh, concentrate some, something along the lines of 30 watts of solar energy onto the cell. And then uh, we generate you know, some amount of, of electric current from that, but the remainder of that solar energy was starting to heat and need to be dissipated. Um, and so we, oh, sorry, I forgot about the side there of the trackers. So 
we realized that we needed to kind of go back to the drawing board of the product, simplify the product, remove a lot of the metal, remove the heat sinks, um, and that, then we might have an opportunity to really compete with silver solar panels on an ongoing basis. So let me make a little side about trackers, because the other thing that Morgan Solar did differently is we actually changed the way we build trackers and changed the way we deploy that. Companies uh, up till Morgan Solar, if you'll recall the previous slide with the large crane lowering the massive um, solar panels onto a huge tracker. Um, trackers have been made massive by, uh, by previous companies uh, pursuing this, and we had this concept that if we could mass produce small things, uh, that it would be cheaper than making a small number of large things. And that's a, that was a sort of a design philosophy that underpinned what we did on the trackers. Um, because we could see that everywhere else in the solar industry, people were um, coming into this problem as a big civil construction problem where you would need one or two massive but incredibly precise uh, tracking units. And if one goes down and needs maintenance, then you need to bring in a crane, you need to you know, decommission the whole system, uh, and maintenance can be complicated and costly. And we thought, well, what if we took a different approach? What if we went the completely other direction? Um, what if we had something that was really small and could be serviced on the ground by someone standing on the ground, uh, where any defects that happened could be addressed by an individual person in 15 minutes and wouldn't require uh, stopping production of the whole solar panel site? Um, no one else was going down this approach, uh, going down this road, and honestly, at the time, we thought if someone else figured out a way to make large scale tra trackers cheaper, then we're going to buy those. And there's a lot of people trying to do that development. But we're going to try this other approach of micro trackers uh, to see if that's going to lead somewhere good. And the, the great thing about doing that is, because bear in mind, you know, all this time, Morgan Solar is a startup company while we're doing all this development. And it is much cheaper to build a little thing than it is to build the big thing. So if you want to iterate and you want to make a design better, then building 20 little things lets you get a lot more distance than building one or two mega projects where your opportunity to learn is really limited. And we've actually been pretty successful with this product. We now have um, systems with customers just using regular old silicon solar panels um, in India, California, Japan, Hawaii. We're building a very large project in Pakistan next year that I'm excited about. And we're pursuing a bunch of projects in Mexico and Africa, South Africa. Uh, as well as uh, the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is obviously a big market. And we're seeing a lot of adoption of trackers by the silicon solar panel industry because, um, well, basically because you get a lot more uh, energy generated for a given installed system. So what we have here is a system from California. And you can just see the total energy that you're obtaining on this particular day from the track PV, which is the um, tail curve uh, behind it. Uh, it's a lot broader. You're, if you're getting peak power production for more of the day um, versus a fixed tilt uh, solar system, which would be the kind of conventional PV you find on uh, on racks on the rooftop or in a field somewhere. So tracking has definitely proven to you know, boost yields, and commercially, it's getting more and more adoption. Uh, Morgan Solar Tracker is doing well in the market, uh, but globally, the market for trackers is uh, in the gigawatt with this one. Um, and so we're very excited that we've been able to, you know, be commercially active in that field. And the reality is that the trackers have been more visible as bread and butter. Selling trackers has been really enabled us to keep going and develop the, the photovoltaic product. However, you know, really, we're all about the CPV. And with the concentrated panel, uh, with the, the prototype that I brought and, and what we're manufacturing now in our factory in Toronto, um, we can bring the efficiency up uh, to a very high level, to about 30%, uh, with, rather than a 16% silicon solar panel. And so then that means for the same tracker that we sell to someone, instead of being able to generate 3,700 watts per tracker, they can generate you know, 6,000, 6,500 uh, watts per tracker. So their wattage output on a per tracker basis is greater. They need less land, net less trackers, less wires. So we really believe that the CPV is going to uh, enable us to achieve um, really low cost of electricity, uh, staggering low. So we talked a little bit about the development process that we went through. So um, I showed you the previous iteration. Uh, here we were in February 2013 with uh, the new concept. And the new concept was taking the old idea, taking all the best parts of it, the low profile nature of it, um, 
and getting rid of as much material as we could, getting rid of the heat sink, getting rid of the metal. Um, so you can see this is a single optic prototype, which is the first one that we installed um, in the Mojave Desert. Then we moved to this coupon uh, size module, which is the one that I brought with me. And that really was meant to represent a small piece of a much bigger solar panel. And you can see there, that is the solar panel um, design size for the product that we're going to be building uh, in September. Um, so this is the progression that we decided to follow on the product. And, and the reason that we actually started with coupons was this kind of copy of what we learned on the track. If you're going to be building things and iterating over products and refining manufacturing processes, how long does it spend in the oven when it's curing? Uh, what is the you know, alignment procedure for building the module, et cetera. Doing those things on a coupon scale is trivially easier than doing them on a module scale and much less expensive, which lets you go through a lot of iterations cheaply to arrive at a final product that then you can ramp up. And figuring out how to um, iterate and innovate without you know, needing tremendous sums of money is definitely something that I think Morgan Solar has been very good at, doing more with less. And uh, you know, kind of a funny thing because our product is all about doing more with less. It's all about trying to use less material to make more power. So um, this is where we were with the product back in um, back earlier this year. I forget exactly when, maybe January or December. And here's what we're making now. So these are um, what we're still calling the one third modules. Uh, so they're not our full modules. Each one produces around 80 watts of power. Um, it has 160 some optics on the module. And as you can see, it's actually semi transparent to uh, diffuse light. And that's because it's really only harvesting the direct portion of the sunlight and it's uh, subtracting that from the screen. It's really interesting when you stand next to these panels because they cast a black shadow despite the fact that you can see through them at off angles. Um, so we've been testing the modules uh, going back to September, uh, sorry, pardon me. Yeah, going back to September 2013. We've been running continuous testing of the modules in the Mojave Desert, um, as well as in Toronto. Uh, and we've got setups where we're taking ID sweeps of every module uh, every minute um, and comparing those to silicon solar panels uh, in various configurations while simultaneously um, while simultaneously capturing weather data and all the other pertinent data to really understand how your generation works. Um, and I'm very happy to say that the modules have been performing extremely well. Uh, both the early single optic prototypes and the later coupon modules exhibit uh, no degradation. So this is uh, unfiltered uh, daily max power from uh, the Mojave Desert test site. And so just every day we scan for the highest the peak power point for a new module and throw it up on the curve um, with no filtering or adjustment for temperature whatsoever, or, or what have you. And, and what you'll notice is that the curves are, are flat, so the modules aren't appreciably um, uh, degraded in power production. And the nice thing about this is it's consistent with what other CEV uh, companies have found. Um, Soitec at a recent conference in France presented uh, six and seven year data sets from uh, concentrated photovoltaic farms where they show zero detectable degradation in power production. So the nice thing about um, this data and about the other data in um, in the field is that it's clear that the cells to make these modules are not degrading, the capsule materials to the cells are not degrading. So there's a lot of uh, inherent stability to the platform and um, certainly we're enjoying that same kind of uh, lack of degradation that other people have been experiencing. Um, zooming in on the data to talk a little bit about you know things like pointing accuracy of the tractor and angular acceptance. Those of you who know concentrated photovoltaics know that the modules only work when they're pointed at the sun. And they have to be pointed at the sun to a certain degree of accuracy to work well. So our module has around a 0.8 degree half angle um, angular acceptance, which means that if you point off sun by 0.8 degrees, the power output drops by 10%. And as you keep going off sun, the power output continues to drop uh, ever more steeply. However, our tracker has no trouble keeping the panel on sun. So what I've got here on the left is a plot of the DNI, the direct normal radiance um, that our panel converts, and uh, the power from our tracker. And just zooming in over a few um, minute period, you can see that as the DNI varies, um, the panel uh, production, or the power from the panel uh, tracks uh, very closely um, to within you know, better than half a percent. 
So the tracker is keeping the module pointed at the sun um, to a very high degree through uh, all sorts of conditions. And we've got, we've got at this point, you know, multi-year data sets um, sort of backing up these power generation numbers. The other thing we're doing very well is uh, module assembly. So we're measuring um, at, in the modules that we build, we measure the flatness of the modules, we measure the mutual alignment of all the various components. And what you can see here is that uh, these, are, these are measurement plots from a particular build, just in early March of this year. And uh, you can see that the majority of the module optics are within 0 0.1 degrees of the uh, of a uniform plane, with a handful of outliers up in the uh, 0.18 degree or 0.23 degree offset. But the bottom line is that we're holding 100% of the optics on the module, so we're getting a very tight uh, distribution. And then we are um, tracking it to a, a sufficient degree to keep the power at the level it needs to be at, which is really all we need to do. Um, so talking a little bit about thermals, one thing people always ask us is, well, if you don't have a heat sink, and if the cell is in the middle of the panel, then how come it doesn't get hot? And in fact, a solid panel of the kind that we build has a vastly superior thermal dissipation, uh, has vastly superior thermal dissipation characteristics than a box-style module. So a normal CPE module would feature a, a lens and a cell below. Those two two components are held together because you are building a box with a lid, and it's full of air. And so the heat from the cell can really only effectively be dissipated off the back plane of that module, off the back side. In our module, heat can be dissipated off the front and back side. And I'm actually not an expert on heat flow, but I know that it's a, uh, an exponential process of doubling the surface area over which you can dissipate heat um, more than halves the temperature of the cell uh, in operation. And so um, what we find in typical operation, and I uh, apologize for the fonts that don't seem to be cooperating, what we find under typical oper operation is that our cells are around 30 degrees Celsius above the ambient temperature. Um, so if you're 50 degrees Celsius outside on a thinking hot day in Kuwait, then the cells are going to be operating at around 80 degrees Celsius, which is perfectly acceptable for the materials. Um, this was just some validation we did of that. So we took a coupon module, put it in a continuous wave solar simulator, and exposed it to uh, 900 watts per meter, square, uh, per meter squared for 4,000 seconds. And you can just see uh, the cells start to heat up, which causes their voltage to drop. The voltage drops slightly over a period of time. I can't recall the exact time constant. Of, of, um, but the bottom line is that uh, the cell temperature stabilizes at a delta T of around 33 degrees. So this is nice validation that the uh, modules aren't overheating during, during use. And of course, that's consistent with what we see in the field. Um, so we're looking to get this out and all over the world as quickly as possible. Um, right now, we have systems in Toronto and in the Mojave Desert. We are installing this. We've got systems installed. Um, uh, we had systems installed at the University of Ottawa as well. But we're moving to put more systems into places like Colorado, um, Spain, and uh, the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. Um, and the platform that we're using to do that is these little demonstrator systems. So you can see um, it's a small thing, stands about this tall, uh, fits in a crate, and can be shipped anywhere in the world. Um, it has a weather station on it. Uh, it has uh, instruments on it to measure the sunlight, et cetera. And we mount it with two of our CPD panels and then four silicon PD panels, two of them on a tractor, and then two of them in a fixed rack. And this uh, standalone demonstrator unit can just be trivially deployed, popped open anywhere, and can begin to gather data on solar resource and relative power generation between competing technologies. Um, again, we're looking for ways to do more with less. Of course, we're also building large-scale projects in the um, you know, 10 uh, kilowatt to 1 megawatt range. And we've got a number of projects like that in development, uh, and including some you know, 10 megawatt projects in development. However, um, those all take time, and we are trying to improve. And so for us to basically get these uh, panels into hands of customers tomorrow, 
this is the approach that we're taking. And we're deploying you know, dozens of these units right now. So it's an exciting time. We're looking forward to next year when we're going to be able to show um, cumulative data sets from multiple locations, all on the same modules. The other thing this lets you see is things like how, what are the soiling rates in a given location? How do they compare? And the reason we have two of each module is because we rec uh, recommend that the people hosting these systems clean one set of modules on a bi-weekly schedule and leave the other set of modules to just soil indefinitely over, over the whole period of the year. Um, in this way, we're able to really see, okay, how are the technologies uh, performing compared to one another? Um, now, I mentioned that modules are transparent. Here's one from the back. But one thing that's interesting to note is, okay, like how much light is actually coming through the module? And what can we do with that light? Because some people are, have expressed interest in using this kind of technology um, in applications where that light coming through the module has some other passive benefit. So for example, if you were to deploy a system like this on a rooftop uh, over, a, um, over, a, over a series of skylights, the direct light, the glare from the sun would not come through, but the daylight and the indirect light would. It's something that might be kind of fun. Uh, for my purposes, I'm actually more interested in trying to harvest that energy separately from the direct light using some other kind of low-cost um, photovoltaic device, so perhaps a thin film module or something like that. Um, what we have on this curve, this was just, I pulled this from the other week um, here in Toronto. So we're, we're doing some testing where we place a silicon PV module behind one of our CPU modules, and we're measuring how much energy is it producing uh, in, that, in that position. And it's essentially just absorbing the indirect light. And so you can see here, there's four curves up. The topmost curve is the small CPD module. Uh, and below that, you have the tracked PD module. Um, below that, you have the fixed tilt module. And you can see again, as before, this uh, energy generation curve over the course of the day where the fixed tilt PD module is peaking in its power production at midday and then dropping off in the afternoon and morning, whereas the tracked uh, PD and CPD modules are performing more uniformly throughout the day. And then uh, at the very bottom there, you've got the PD module behind the CPD module, and it's lighting through around 15% uh, of the energy in Toronto. So that's how much the diffuse light is getting through. Um, we've measured the diffuse light in, uh, in Toronto and, of course, in California uh, and a few other locations like Spain, and we're finding that the range of values is between sort of 5 and 15%. So what's next for us for Morgan Solar? Um, well, we're basically we have to deliver on some customer projects right now. We have uh, we're, one of our first customers is a U.S. Air Force base in Hawaii, where we're going to be installing the system uh, in about six months. Um, and then we are doing systems in Nevada, uh, Pakistan, and Spain. Um, the Nevada and Spain systems are being done with. Uh, investors in Morgan Solar. Morgan Solar is very fortunate to have the support of some really great uh, energy utility companies. So Iberdrola is a Spanish utility. They're one of the world's largest renewable energy utilities. Um, and they're doing a project with us in Spain. And in Nevada, we're, we're happy to be working with Enbridge here in Canada, who's uh, been a long supporter of this technology of Morgan Solar, and is helping us roll with that as we're doing now. Um, we're also continuing to add capacity to our factory in Toronto. I've got a few photos here. One is of our, our clean room where we do cell packaging, and then below is just some bigger place equipment that we use to assemble the actual electric circuits in the modules. Um, we aim to be deploying tens of megawatts in the first half of 2016 out of this facility in Toronto. We can ramp this facility up to around 50 uh, megawatts per year of production, and so we're doing what is necessary to make that happen. The other thing we're doing is we're continuing to improve the efficiency of the product. So this is a, this is a graph from Enron. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Uh, but two lines have been highlighted on this. Um, the top line, the steepest line, is the uh, trend line through all of the uh, triple junction cell um, world records going back to you know, the mid, uh, going back to the early 80s. What you can see is that triple junction cells have been improving very steadily and very um, uh, steeply year over year uh, for a long period of time, and we fully anticipate that this trend is going to keep going. Um, the bottom curve is the uh, trend line for silicon solar panels, um, which are also improving efficiency, but as you can see, slightly more slowly. 
So we are definitely riding this curve of efficiency improvements. Right now, the modules that we're building are not using the best cells in the world. We are working with a number of cell providers to get the best cells in the world into these modules. But we're using you know, 2005 world record breaking cells, uh, and we're achieving a 30% efficiency. Once we get up into the current state of the art of best cells, we should be able to push our efficiency much higher. Whoops. Um, I seem to have turned that off. Yeah. Um, and I'll actually, oh, pardon me. There we are. So, right in 2012, we set an efficiency target for um, this product at uh, 30%. That was the efficiency target that we gave to ourselves when we were uh, setting about redeveloping the technology and trying to simplify it and roll out a new model. The new target is 40%. We expect to be able to achieve 40% in the lab module um, next year, and in production, we're aiming to be up in the 36 to 30 percent range. Um, we don't, of course, there's never any guarantee you're going to achieve something. We haven't achieved 40 percent yet. However, there's no technical barrier that we can think of that will prohibit us from getting 40 percent efficiency. Uh, and that's just based on using the best possible cells available today. The other thing uh, that is you know, no other intervention of the world. The reason that we're doing this is um, levelized fossil electricity. I'm just throwing up there the uh, LCOE curves from Wikipedia, um, showing uh, the variable uh, costs of different technologies. And uh, the reason that we're excited about what we're doing is that we believe that in large volumes, um, we're going to get our levelized cost of electricity for this, these models down to two and a half to five cents. You know, obviously depending on how much sunlight there is in the place where they're installed. Um, and that is really the reason that we are motivated to keep doing this work, um, and that's why we're pushing to get this technology out and out there. So thank you very much, and uh, take care of the questions you have. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much for the, for the exciting talk, and we have time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Can you say something about the, uh, the optics that you use, because you mentioned that you use something different than yeah, so basically we use um, uh, optics that rely on diffraction and then total internal reflection to do a kind of wave guiding in order to uh, bring the light to the cell. It's not literally a wave guide, but um, I mean, you might describe it as a prismatic reflector. Uh, you know, it's just a planar concentrator optic. Um, we, it's, it's difficult to just describe in words. Um, we do have a whole host of published patents. Um, which are good reading, and, and, and uh, just start with the most recent ones to figure out how it works exactly. But um, yeah, we have to explain it in more detail. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Okay, so that, and that was really, um, uh, that's been the case since the very beginning. The whole premise of the product was how can we replace most of the material with cheap um, injection molded parts? And we wanted to move away from some of the more expensive molding techniques that have been employed elsewhere in the industry. Um, and so we basically mold these objects as, you know, they're like molding uh, ball caps. They're, um, or, you know, ball caps are uh, yeah, very expensive. You talk about light uh, going through. Yes. Do you have a sense of what is the number compared to the regular spectrum? What is the, what is the color of the light going yes. through? So, uh, yeah, certainly the optical transfer function of the whole module would be comparable to the optical transfer function of a few millimeters of piano bed uh, and glass. So it's really not, um, the only thing coloring the light is the bulk absorption of the material itself. There's no uh, special effects in the concentration itself. Yeah. Okay, we, have, we have time for one more question. Uh, on a cloudy day, how much electricity do you generate so here, I'll, I'll go back to that slide that showed some cloudy day points. Because the truth is, is that we don't generate anything on a properly cloudy day. Um, but I would argue that regular solar panels don't generate that much either. Um, so if you come to this slide, you can see here. Does this have a laser pointer on it? Uh, I cannot see. Sorry, I can't see laser pointers. Um, so if you look over here in the afternoon, right, uh, there's a point where a cloud dip happens. And so you can see um, the red line, which is the CPD, dipping down uh, very low. The track PD dips down with it. Uh, it. There's slightly less of a dip, obviously. The only thing that remains is the diffuse portion. 
And so the module that was behind the CPP module is the one that changes the least when the cloud comes out. And so the diffuse portion of the light is always there. Um, and it'll, be, it'll continue to generate a dimensional PV panel. With the CPD panel, obviously it goes down um, to near zero uh, when it's heavily budded. Um, so this technology isn't for everybody, it's for some parts of the world. Uh, Toronto is actually probably not a natural market for it, it just happens to be where we are, so we can test it. Um, and the last thing I'd like to say before I go is that we do have a number of positions open right now in Northern Solar, including for uh, uh, postdoc and PhD uh, level positions. So anyone who's interested should uh, get in touch. Um, I don't think actually, I don't think the postdoc position is posted on the website right now. But if you are interested in joining the company and you have that kind of background, um, or if you know someone like that, then uh, I guess uh, I think my email address is on the last slide. Um, and it's not, no, it's not. So it's uh, just jp at Okay, thanks. Okay, th thank you very much.